Well, John, you made it. Headlining the Beachland Ballroom. <laughs> Disaster 2024. <laughs> Took over 72 years, but you made it. First and foremost, the memes and rubes. I want to say to you something you already know, but I want to say it publicly because your dad is no longer here to say it to you privately. You were the sunshine of John's life. You were, you are, the apples of his eye. And here's something you may not know yet, but I do know, because I have a mom and dad up in the big sky. Your dad will always be around. Let me also say, and this is on behalf of Marnie and Patsy and Michael as well. Do I have everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to Kathy for pulling the celebration of life together. And while she may be tired of hearing this, thank you again, Kathy, for having wisdom and courage enough to take charge of things starting on Memorial Day. You knew that while you might then be lacking in formal legal authority for that role, you had the chief qualification. You were the person John wanted in charge. And a big thank you to everyone who's come here today. We have California in the house. We have Illinois in the house. We have New York in the house. We have Minnesota in the house. We have Wisco in the house. And if we count online, I believe we may have New Jersey, Oregon, Kentucky, and Michigan, Lyon, France, and London, England. And thank you to those who contributed to Mimi's Tribute Radio Show, to everybody who has emailed, texted, or called with your kind thoughts and remembrances who have set aside with prayer for, or who have otherwise spent time, no matter how brief, thinking about John and his family, our family. Thank you. It, it, it really, really means a lot. And, um, and even if we didn't know you were saying a prayer, well, we knew, you know. I love John. And I love John, and I will always love John. There are no ands, ifs, or buts about it. On one level, that's as simple as it is. He was just one of us five Thompson kids, all for one and one for all. Yes, sometimes we fought like dogs and cats. We even had our little spats. I remember the first time I realized I didn't have to let him beat me up. <laughs> it was in the back hall in Emerson Drive, and it was exhilarating. <laughs> and to extend the Saturday morning cartoon reference, John was our top cat, our ringleader, who looked over us. And yes, this is frightening, guided us. <laughs> Climbing over rooftops, and of course, the old burning paper bag in the driveway. <laughs> and you know what was in that paper bag? Well, the homeowner found out when he came out to stamp out the fire. It was all over his shoe. And each of the five of us, at John's democratic insistence, <laughs> who will help me make the bread, contributed to the bag's contents. <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> On another level, it's much more complicated. It always is. But with John as our oldest siblings, and really, you didn't have to be related by blood to understand this. You just had to know John for a bit. It was always more complicated 
because God broke the mold making John. Our mother in the last month of her life with no diminishment of love for her firstborn and knowing full well the answer to the question was from you mom, from you, asked in wonder as if there must be another answer to this question. Where did he come from? <laughs> John was one of a kind, by nature, yes, but by sheer force of will as well. Our cousin, Wendy Clodier Solhan, who you'll hear directly from later today, summed it up pretty well for me over the phone in the days after John died. He was just bound and determined to live an unusual life. And that he did. I remember having a conversation with our dad about John when I was in my mid-twenties. And I said something like, well, you know, dad, experimentation with one's life is the highest form of art. And he looked at me like I was crazy. What? <laughs> John did grudgingly concur with me in a conversation we had in April of this year that weirdness in itself in and of itself, did not constitute a virtue. I never did get John to concede that the Johnny Rivers version of Secret Agent Man was the superior version. <laughs> if I have accounted for leap years correctly and chosen the appropriate conventions for the date of my birth and the date of John's death, I spent the first 25,809 days of my life with John on the same earth. Don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to speak for a minute for every day. It's, it bottoms out at about, it averages out about three seconds a day. I may be off a day or two, but you get the picture. You know the login security question? Who was your child best friend, childhood best friend? Well, that's an easy one for me to remember and type in. J-O-H-N. And in case you want to crack the online access codes for either John or me, let me save you some time. First pet's name, Boozer. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> name of my favorite childhood pet, our beloved dog, Tony, who would bolt out of second story windows to answer the call of the wild. <laughs> name of first elementary school, Fernway. Oldest cousin's name, Karen. More on cousins to come. Name of your high school, Hawken. The site of the Moon Commune and where John founded the Progressive Union of Students and the main distribution points for its uh, publication, Puss Magazine. It seems like John and I did everything together growing up and John was on board for many of my life's first and the late teens and early 20s, we're gonna skip over today. First trip to the St. Luke's emergency room. Compliments of a baseball bat swung by John in the backyard. We were actually learning to play baseball under tutelage of my dad, and I don't think it was intentional. But when we paired up with placing razor blades pilfered from my dad's shaving stuff in my crib, well, it does make you wonder. And come to think of it, second trip to St. Luke's emergency room. <laughs> Running full bore face first into a tree in a spirited game of blind hide and go seek. <laughs> Orchestrated by you know who, John. The same John who started with our backyard water spigot and hose, attached all of the backyard hoses on Ingleside together with the last hose end inserted into a milk chute. And he went back to our house and turned the water on. <laughs> the same John who, locating a pair of pliers that our grandpa left out from some project, maybe involving wiring, took those pliers to our grandmother's wiry gray hair from the back as she talked on the phone. And grandma explained, exclaiming, and this is not the last time someone loudly expressed the sentiment. Why, John, why? <laughs> what in the world possessed you? Yes, this is all true. And let the historical record reflect that eight years before PUS came out in the month or two leading up to the 1968 presidential election, 
featuring on page one either Richard Daly or George Wallace. The artistry left open both possibilities. Which one was it, John Kafka? Was it Dick Daly or George Daly. Wallace? Daly. Daly. Whoever the guy was talking into a microphone that was attached to a cord, well, not quite a cord, coming out of his pants zipper. <laughs> Let the record reflect that eight years before that, John established the Nixon Lodge headquarters on Ingleside Road as our house is the headquarters just down the block from the Kennedy Johnson operation, where Queen Judy Meyer ruled the roost from the top of the stack about 20 foldable lawn chairs. She climbed out onto that top chair from a second floor walkout porch. Well, that political affiliation was not to last. And our grandmother Ruth's path declaration during the Reagan years, you'll all be Republican someday. It did not come to pass. <laughs> When Kathy called me shortly before 9 on Monday morning, July 8th, I was on my way to meet with John, the physical therapist, I think. Maybe it was a speech therapist. I can't remember now. I just wailed out loud. And after settling down a bit to try to be helpful in taking care of some practical things, thank goodness I had and have that kind of stuff to do. I spend a lot of time in my mind, sometimes while wandering the mean streets of Shaker Heights, <laughs> snot rags stuffed into my pockets, thinking about John and our times together, and crying and smiling, and sometimes laughing out loud, thinking crazy thoughts, like God raised his hand and said, that's it, you've learned enough. <laughs> time to change things up. And I had no idea who the you was, whether the you was John, whether the you was just all of us. And by nightfall reversing course, that God raised his hand and said, you guys are never going to get it. I'm going to change things up. And I include myself in, in the you guys in that. thinking crazy thoughts like her mother came to get John and spirit him away to the afterlife. That she came through the portrait of her as a young woman, a girl even maybe, painted maybe five years before she became a mom. Wendy, you know the picture I'm talking about. And that picture hung on the wall overlooking the bed where John died. And in the moment of that thought, crazy as it is, and it is utter nonsense. But in that moment, I had the thought, it was so beautiful, it had to be true. And in my mind's eye, seeing their mom and dad when they were young, I mean really young, my dad in a blue sweater trimmed in red and ringed with white reindeer chest high John and me sitting in front of turquoise plastic cereal bowls at a wooden picnic table way up north in Michigan with the deep blue lake that comes up to the edge of the pine forest. Am I making this stuff up or did it really happen? It really happened, but it does make me wonder, is it going to happen again? But I don't think so. And amidst the sadness of this is gone, gone forever, a deep gratefulness that I got to be part of this, part of John's life, part of our life growing up together. A big part of that life involved their grandparents, Tommy and Margaret, John and Ruth, all four of whom had a deep, lasting impact on our lives. I can't tell you how meaningful that is. And it also involved their mom and dad's sisters' families, the Blacks and the Browns and the Clodiers and the Kincaids, the aunts and the uncles and the countless cousins, our wonderful cousins. And we have heard and felt an outpouring of remembrances and love from them. And here's but a small sample. Kim Clodier Green, 
I've always experienced a sort of stunned awe that is often brilliant, sometimes inscrutable, usually inexhaustible commentary on everyone and everything under the sun. <laughs> this is a great line. He had more to say than anyone I have ever known. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Sidney Brown Plummer. As a kid, the best memories I have are the times we spent all together running around like a wild pack with John as our fearless leader. I felt wild and safe at the same time. I just loved that, wild and safe at the same time. Chris Kincaid. He was Tarantino before Tarantino was Tarantino. <laughs> uh, Chris, I, I think you're listening, and I did read very quickly your email this morning, and it seems as if you've gone into the myth-making business with uh, a sideline in numerology. That is, it's going to take me a while to take that in. Laura Kincaid. Laura, I, I looked for the email that you wrote shortly after John died this morning and I couldn't find it. But I'm pretty sure your opening line uh, contained the phrase, incredibly observant and absolutely oblivious. <laughs> and how can that be? So they don't go hand in hand normally but they did with John. Laura also wrote uh, another email and, uh, yesterday, and in that she described many things, but uh, one was the first time that John visited her and their song and their family in Lyon. He arrived with his whole office in tow. He asked if he could set up his stuff at our dining room table. We said sure, not knowing that his stuff was a 50-inch screen monitor with a secondary computer that he needed to finish his gambling site newsletter. That was John promising to not take up too much space as he spread his stuff throughout your house. Notice you speaking to people who know this. Needless to say, we took our meals out on the patio that year. I, I, I know Marty knows the feeling of John uh, bringing his traveling office with him. And because Siobhan and I live in the same town as John, we, we never did uh, experience that. Although I have traveled with him, and he does travel with that, that office. Um, but Siobhan knew John before this but her first real introduction to John was right after we were married and we lived on Glencairn Road uh, in Shaker Heights and we had a white carpet that we inherited from the previous owner and John brought in a car oily car battery and he placed it right on that white carpet. Absolutely oblivious. And now John's up there in the ancestral big sky, full of love and wisdom, with our family's Hall of Famers. The bar to get in is you just got to live and die. <laughs> but when you think about it, there's no jest about it. That's quite a feat. He's up there in the big sky with Joni and Clint, Shirley and Denny, Kent, Kit, Penny. Connie and Stevens Hayden, Graham and Grandpa, Nan and Big John, our mom and dad. You know, since our family doesn't get together that often, and since I'm now the eldest, I'm going to wave in uh, our Uncle Bob and our Aunt Joni into the Hall of Fame. Uh, even though they're still on this earth, they're, they're, they're coming in under a lifetime achievement uh, <laughs> exemption. And, and Jojo, uh, the trip we made to Hollywood is etched upon my mind. This was in 1962, and our grandfather, who we called Big John, and Jojo, and John, and I went out to California. 
And that opened up a whole new world to John. <laughs> and it inspired him when he got home to write to Hannah Barbara with the idea that the Flintstones, Flintstones should meet the Jetsons. <laughs> well, you know what happened. They buried it for a while. But a couple years later, it happened. <laughs> I remember asking our grandpa once on Christmas Eve when I was about eight. He had come upstairs to teach me how to properly hang up a suit rather than ball it up and throw it in the corner. What are we? What do we believe? And I will never forget this. He said, we believe in Judeo-Christian values and the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I think of how unfailingly, without exception, John was kind and polite toward all the people. And there were a lot of people who helped him in the last tough time of his life. I mean, really tough. It had its silver linings, but it was tough. And John is the only one, really, who knows how tough it was. And he treated everyone, everyone, with kindness and respect. And I remember talking with John about this and commenting to him how honorable that was and how proud our mom and dad would be of him and how he was, how he was handling that whole situation, the immobility, immobility, the dependency, the not knowing what was going to happen. When you think about it, in a way it's kind of a pathetic two 70-year-old guys talking about what their mom and dad would think. But that's what we talked about. And we also talked about matters great and small, to Kim's point, everything under the sun, including the nature of the true self, whatever the heck that means. But there was a time, there was a moment that we both knew what it meant when we were talking about it for a minute or so. Something like whatever job you were doing, whatever role you might be playing, you were always coming from the same place. You were always the same person. I'm John. That's who I am. We were not a church-going family, but my dad, our dad, made sure we do the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like to say that prayer now. And for those of you who are so inclined, you are welcome you are encouraged to say it along with me. And if you want to join hands with someone close to you, that's okay too. And if you don't want to say it, and you don't want to hold hands with anyone, that's just fine. So here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. During Mimi's radio show, David Thomas said something like, Johnny, the world will never see the likes of you again. And indeed, we all probably won't. I know I won't. But maybe now God is busy building a new improved mold with John's help. <laughs> and while they work on it together, John can tell God all that John has learned. <laughs> I just hope God has the time for it. <laughs> for all the stories. But I guess God... She has plenty of that. She has all the time in the world. John, I love you, and I will see you down the road. Up next, we'll hear 
excerpt from my dad's sister, Marty. It's good to see so many people who love John. I'm actually, my brother built it a fab job. I'm not gonna comment about my personal experience of being John's sister or being in the family with John. I'm reading, I'm here as a ringer. I'm reading a remembrance that was um, sent over by Howard Halley, uh, a dear friend of John's for many, many years. So I'm Howard talking now. I'd known John since coming to Hawkins School in seventh grade, but the start of what turned out to be a 60 year relationship didn't happen until a couple years later when we were freshmen at the upper school. Just how things first clicked between us is a bit murky. I recall that it began with a conversation we had when I stumbled upon John studying by himself, which I find dubious studying, but <laughs> studying by himself in the vestibule of the back door for Hawkins main building. On the same topic, John mentioned an incident in which I came to his defense while he was being hassled by a classmate during lunch one day, though I was never sure whether this was before or after we became friends. In any case, my existence at Hawkins to that point had been largely that of an outsider who was shunned. John offered a gateway to acceptance into what became a circle of guys who shared a certain cynical, anti-authoritarian outlook with John as the lead instigator of what could be charitably called countercultural hijinks, <laughs> which, to be fair, were just as pure our aisle as the garden variety shenanigans common to hormonally adult teenage boys. We were full of shit. But given the apocalyptic tone of the era, the inner city riots, the campus protests, the political assassinations, and the looming specter of being packed off to Vietnam, perhaps we had reason to be, whether we truly knew it or not. Whatever the case, absurdism seemed to be the order of the day, and John knew how to serve it up in spades. There were, for example, the Super 8 movies John made, including a sort of homage to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, it featured a narration accompanied by a soundtrack sourced from a thrift store, an old 78 RPM record titled Chinese Foxtrot. The main image was of a group of us having tea on a formally set table in the middle of the creek running through Gates Mills. Then there were other times when we stomped a giant communist hammer and sickle in a snowbank within view of the school's classrooms. <laughs> and indulged in an ill-conceived stab at sincerity involving a slideshow peon to spring that was roundly and deservedly laughed out of the school auditorium. There were trips to the grubby, disinfectant scented environs of the Roxy Burlesque Theater in downtown Cleveland, which became the rite of passage for the members of what became known as the R Squad. The black athletic jackets we wore with that name stitched in yellow on the back offered testament to our appreciation for bad taste, squalor, and existential despair. <laughs> the culmination of these activities occurred during junior year. Oh, we're, you're going to hear this story again. Uh, during <laughs> junior year with the publication of our version of an underground paper called PUS. Its contents included a cartoon of Chicago Mayor Richard Daley, who'd recently presided over the debacle of the 1968 Democratic Convention in the Windy City. He was pictured holding a microphone snaking out of his pants as an extension of his penis. The school's admin, and I gotta say, Mom, I'm sorry I said penis at a funeral, but it happened. <laughs> um, the school administration's reaction was immortalized in a yearbook photo capturing the PUS editorial team, headed by John, being frog-marched into the headmaster's office. The caption pithily read, this picture is easily worth a thousand words. <laughs> oh. During the summer after graduation, John, who'd gotten into using the first video camera produced for the consumer market, rallied the troops one last time for the making of Simon versus the Nazis. This opus involved an oddball named Simon Emler, who, uh, whom I'd encountered at a job at the Terminal Tower newsstand. I'd watch him harangue commuters during evening rush hour on a daily basis. And John, of course, wanted to meet him. As it turned out, Simon styled himself as a communist agent who regularly infiltrated the headquarters of the Cleveland chapter of the American Nazi Party, a shabby storefront to which we followed him one day. John arranged a subsequent videotaping of a proposed debate between Simon 
and one Casey Kalemba, leader of the Cleveland Nazi branch. The subject was something along the lines of white supremacy and its contribution to Western civilization. Well, I wasn't at the shoot itself. I saw the results, which were as weird as one might expect. John was always at the center of it all, though I leave it to someone else to recount his later endeavors, his record store, Hideo Di Hideo's Discodrome, his involvement with the band Pear Ubu, etc., which were consistent with the worldview he forged in high school. But I prefer to remember him as he was back then because he played such a crucial role in my own coming of age. Who knows what I would have been if I'd never met him? Would I have wound up as I did in New York involved in the art world? Probably not because in retrospective, I realized that John provided a template for what it means to follow your creative impulses for better or worse. And for that, I am truly grateful. Up next, we're gonna hear from Robert Wheeler. Good afternoon, thank you all for coming. I generally don't like speaking in public, but Kathy asked if I would, so. Um, I can speak more about the impact John had on me. Um, I lost my page there, but nevertheless. Uh, I grew up at Cedar Fairmount down Lenox Road, right around the corner from the Cleveland Heights Drome. Shortly after I moved from there, the Drome opened up. Um, I would go visit them and meet people like Jim Ellis who would turn me on to all these great records. And uh, I went one day and the new Peruku 45 came out, 30 seconds over Tokyo. And I was going to buy it and John says, no, it's $1.95. For $1.50 you can see the whole band tonight, the whole set. Um, I'm a frugally minded person so I went for the, the band. Uh, my life took a pivot that night and I've never recovered. Um, I saw the greatest rock band in the world. I met the people, and they became lifelong friends, like time over there. Um, Alan and I talk every day, um, et cetera, et cetera. Tony introduced me to the woman who would become my wife. Um, I had been in a really bad car wreck in, in uh, well, anyway, that was November 11th, 1976. December 26th, I got in a really bad car wreck that put me in the hospital for three months. And um, when I came out, I had a little bit of settlement money from the railroad. I had a railroad, I had a freight train, so in the car, I don't want to talk about it. Um, the song Folly of Youth kind of covers that. You can hear the trains running in the background. Um, so I took my settlement money and I talked to Alan and he said buy an EML and I had gone to Pi Corporation which is on 24th and right across the old Agora. And David Yost was up there and I was playing with stuff and I was like, this place is amazing. How'd you learn all this? He said I took electronics. I was turning 21, didn't know how to do anything, figured I'd take electronics. Um, that's where my career came from. I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, later system manager of hospitals, etc. Uh, but my whole life took a pivot that day with John's. John just pointed me in the right direction. And he just had a, everything I've done in life, um, except for some things I work with the museum and farming. But everything else, John just comes from that conversation. And just acknowledging what a huge impact he had on me as a person. I would not be here, I would not know a lot of these people, but I made lifelong friends. Um, that first night at Pirates Cove with uh, Perubu, I met Chris Yarma and Russ Sherman, shortly after Jim Jones, etc. and just, your dad had a huge impact on me. Um, Mimi and John went with us on, I was in Paribu for 20 something years. Mimi and John went with us on a tour, I think it was 2017 in Europe. And that was great fun. I said to Mimi, I, we were in a German club and I said, you have got the best spring break ever. 
and uh, we were able to sing happy birthday to her in Berlin. I think it was her 17th birthday. But uh, thank you all for coming. You've had a huge impact on everyone here, I'm sure. That's why you're here. Next, we're going to hear from Marky Ray. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the family for letting me into the archives of John's work and his life's work. Um, I'm one of the many Cleveland punk rock musicologists in town, and uh, I helped the family assemble just some of, some of John's work. There's an immense collection of his life's work, and uh, this is just sort of a, a musicology history standpoint of uh, how I sort of came back to meet John uh, later in his life and later in my life, but uh, I was, um, I'll explain here in a bit, but uh, like Robert said, uh, John's life was a prof had a very profound effect on me and uh, uh, the pagans especially who I ended up working for changed my life, and that's kind of how I got to know John roundabout. Um, John, Johnny Dromet Thompson, to say that Johnny Dromet Thompson ca uh, captured the zeitgeist of punk rock and new age at the time of turmoil in Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, when we were down for the count would be an understatement. The malaise, the urban decline, the disintegration of the Rust Belt in the late 1970s descended on Cleveland like a cold, wet, dirty blanket enveloping every aspect of our once great city, whether it was politics, the decline of the working blue class, or the sheer grasping, gasping for air and the many independent musicians, artists, and great thinkers that were planning to escape, or were planning their escape route in a path through music and time and space. Quoting Arthur Rimbaud, I say, one must be a seer, one must make oneself a seer, the poet himself is a seer, by a long, prodigious, and rational disordering of all the senses. Every form of love, of suffering, of madness, he searches himself, he consumes all of the poisons in him, and keeps only their quintessence. He reaches for the unknown, and even if crazed, he ends up losing the understandings, and even if he ends up losing the understandings of his visions, at least he has seen them. John was like the great thinkers, writers, and creative souls, the record men of the 20th century, such as Leonard Chess, Sam Phillips, Ama Tertigan, quote, quote, from quoting from the book, Mockers and Rockers, that's America, no pedigree, the great ones give birth to themselves. John found something to create, to promote, to exploit for the betterment of a small but creative explosive culture that embodied Cleveland and Northeast Ohio during the day-glow polyester-clad environs of the 1970s. A gathering of the disenfranchised, if you will, with such colorful characters as Peter Lochner, Mick Mellon, David Thomas, Jim Ellis, Michael Weldon, Andrew Klimek, and Mike Hudson. John had created a record store, a record label, and a launch pad of artistic expression. A launch pad that had a small but loyal community that rivaled the likes of New York and London the other punk rock and new wave centers of the world at the time, albeit smaller and a little, but no less important, impressive, and colorfully explosive. Born and raised in Cleveland, John and his wild, creative, hyper-driven mind helped spawn a minor music revolution that grew to eventually take over the world. Um, excuse me, influence the world, I might say as well. Cleveland, the mistake by the lake, the city that had the river that burned, often derided, always the underground. John, the Drome, and his colorful cast of co cohorts managed to rise above the commercial den that was represented by the power brokers of commercial radio cover bands in the middle of the road crap and our rock and roll that inundated the terrestrial radio stations of the time. Perubu, the Pagans, Devo, the Cramps, the Lepers, X Blank X, Johnny and the Dicks, the Electric Eels, Mir Mirrors, the Polystyrene Jazz Band, Bernie and the Invisibles, and many, many others would come to pay homage to John 
uh, and ultimately be hugely influenced by the likes of John, his beautifully twisted visions of art, music, graphics, graphics and commerce as it came crashing onto the disconnected future of bored misanthropic teens and 20-somethings mixing Dada with data panic. A whole world vision brought to the light. By creating the Drome, his record store in Cleveland Heights at Cedar and Fairmount began the countless generations of punks, ne'er-do-wells, miscreants, absurd poets and disturbed musicians aching to expound on their lot in life and further their own musical ambitions. Now this is merely an introduction to what you will, you've already heard and will see today. As I've mentioned, I was a mere lad uh, when the Drome had its heyday. My time, I was born and raised in Cleveland Heights, but my time in Cleveland Heights was shortened by my, by my family moving south. My father was a professor at Kent State. We moved there. My father was there from 69 to 74. By the time I got back here, the Drome, one, two, and three, and even the real world had long gone by the time I returned to Cleveland after getting kicked out of a Quaker boarding school and moving to Cleveland, my birthplace, to Coventry Road in 1982. As I, too, was trying to escape the world through my own punk rock travels, truth be, truth be told, that boarding school did me a favor. Uh, famous Cleveland poet Daniel Thompson was my neighbor. Legalized levy posters still dotted the streets, and Peter Lochner's ghost still seemed prescient, although he had already become legend. A friend from that boarding school had moved to New York City and started a rockabilly band with Brian Hudson and the Pagans. It was then and there that I really began to learn the legacy of what John had lot. John had wrought and worked so hard at. Brian Hudson would return to Cleveland with his band, the Kingpins, and play with the reconstituted Pagans, run by his brother, Mike. The two bands would end up touring together, and I became the roadie, along with Charlie Ditto of the Easter Monkeys, which immediately ushered me into Cleveland punk rock royalty and vaulted me into a music community, excuse me, a music community that I still revere and supports me to this day. What an education. It was then and there that I really learned of John and his legacy. The graphics, the music, the singles, the record covers, the store, the people. I was one of those disenfranchised youth. Though I had missed the initial inception of the Klee Punk era, I was wholly embraced by the community, a community that spurred John's vast imagination, his style, his genius level, mad graphics, unequaled, and uh, let alone today. Please listen to the people speaking here today, the incredible stories, the amazing art, the wonderful music, the pictures, and his world. Let's celebrate John's life and his legacy. I am forever honored and indebted to his family for allowing me to speak of his life, excuse me, and trusting me and being able to share his art and music with you today. Thank you. from Bob and Jack Kidney. John was always really good to me and the band and was a huge supporter and uh, he and his wife Kathy uh, gave me work when I was uh, in need of money in their home and they 
bought my artwork to help me, and I knew their daughters when they were very little. And this is John's, uh, we're going to play John's favorite song that we do. And uh, I'm going to play it the way he liked it. So there will be no apologies. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sometimes I wonder, should I stand up cold and go? Thank you. Next we'll hear from Mark Trias. <laughs> Why did you put me on after Robert? <laughs> Robert Kidney, my God. Robert and Jack Kidney. Um, I'm from Minneapolis. I'll, I'm, I'm going to go off script a little bit here and just say... What a treasure you have here in Cleveland with Robert and James Kidney and the Numbers Band. Um, all, um, much of my life I've wished, wished that I could see the Numbers Band play. I wish uh, the circumstances had been a little different, but wow, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to do this now. I'm just so blown away by that. Um, Anyway, um, my name is Mark Trias. Um, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and John and I had a record label in Minneapolis for five years called Treehouse Records. Um, oh. um, can't say we did much to follow his illustrious career in Cleveland, however, um, but um, we did our little bit and um, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about John. Uh, I might go off script a little. There's been so many things that people have said that have reminded me of things that I want to talk about. But I'm going to go with what I've got because I'm not good in speaking in front of people. And I'll do my best here, though. And I should have worn pink. I, <laughs> Kathy said to wear something colorful here. Um, this, this was the best I could do. I didn't have anything in pink. I'm sorry, Kath. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, anyway, John and I met at St. Mary's Treatment Center in Minneapolis in 1984. In those days, at least at this facility and in our particular group, um, confrontation was encouraged among the patients. <laughs> My very first words to John on his first day in group were something to the effect of, you've been talking for 20 minutes now and about how you got here without not once mentioning cocaine. <laughs> John went silent. Hard to believe, right? <laughs> that might be the only time I can remember this, something I said, shut him up. Um, but anyway, he uh, had a puzzled look on his face and just said, I wasn't expecting that. Um, such was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Um, in a commitment to his newfound sobriety, John elected to stay in Minnesota, known by me and its inhabitants as the Land of 10,000 Treatment Centers. For what, ended up, for what ended up being five years, he and I bonded over a desire to stay clean and a shared love of rock and roll, in particular the punk rock era of the late 70s. 
we became fast friends. In time, John began dating my friend Kathy, and I began dating Kathy's friend Lucy, all of us nearly sober. Together, the four of us fumbled our way through those early years of sobriety, leaning on each other and the sober friends we met through our 12-step program, and in John's case, after care at St. Mary's, which is where he met Kathy. Through John, I heard some unreleased tapes by a Cleveland band he put some 45s out by and attempted to quote unquote manage, <laughs> called the Pagans. With the album Barry Live, John and I embarked on a journey that saw us partner up on a record label that eventually saw the release of around 30 records between 1987 and 1990, most of them by Twin Cities based artists. John was the art director and bookkeeper, I was the AR distribution and marketing guy. John laid, all the artwork, laid out all the artwork for all our releases. He was every bit as crucial a part of the partnership as myself, even though the Treehouse label bore play on my last name and is often mistaken to be solely mine, not by any means. I <laughs> couldn't have done any of it without John. Um, it was a rough period though, especially for me, being the more PTSD addled of the two of us trying to play, stay clean and sober while running a label that released records by bands whose op members often had drug and alcohol issues was quite a trip. Difficult, to put it mildly. It certainly played more to my weaknesses than my strengths, I eventually realized. It was with great relief for both John and I that we pulled the plug after three years. But I'm proud of some of the records that we put out and especially proud of the work that John and I managed to put out in the world. Um, John and I remained solid friends after he moved out of the state. He laid out artwork for other projects I worked on for other labels. Bringing everything full circle with regards to John's Cleveland origins, when I began a new label years later, he designed the cover for an archival record I put out by Perubu, which I recorded at the Longhorn Bar in Minneapolis in 1978 on their tour with the Suicide Commandos, who were kind of my version, I guess, of Pagans, kind of, I don't know. They were the punk rock band that changed my life back up in Minneapolis. Anyway, that was the last record we worked on together. I have many fond memories of John and our experiences together. I hope it's okay if I tell this. One particularly humorous one sticks out. John and I were in New York City doing some record label business. John at that time was sporting an unusual look that was all his own. He wore pink tights, with black leather short shorts over them, bright colored shirts or blouses, his long hair clasped back with what was traditionally a woman's beret. I thought he looked like a dwarf or a leprechaun. <laughs> Even somebody was just saying last night uh, over at, at, at Kathy's house that uh, um, John always, even though he wasn't short, he looked short because of some reason, I can't, I can't, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But anyway, um, I, and I had, for some dumb reason, decided to shave my head. So together we're walking down Christopher Street in the village, oblivious to what our collective appearance might imply to passersby. We passed a leather-clad couple who looked like guys from the village people. They stopped in their tracks and stared at us, and one of them in a loud, guttural voice went, yeah! <laughs> I was so used to John being John and my changing hairstyles that it never occurred to me that someone must might mistake us for a couple looking to make some kind of sexual statement. We had a good laugh over that one. More often than not, though, our conversations over the last several years surrounded around our sobrieties. It's safe to say that if we had continued on our previous self-destructive paths, that our lives would have been much, much different. A lot emptier, that is, if we had even survived. John had a couple more bumps in the road than I, but in the end, we both committed to sobriety. I know that he, like me, would tell you that as recovering addicts, the most important thing in our lives, bar none, is a commitment to staying clean. John was always someone I could talk to about the vagaries of a sober life, and I would like to hope vice versa. Um, John's wife, Kathy, and his daughters, Ruby and Mimi, were the loves of his life. It was a joy to see the pride in his face when he spoke of them. 
John made for an unconventional family man, but, he, but eccentricities and all he loved, eccentricities and all, he loved his family more than anything else in his life. In turn, they of course loved him. His family gave his life a center and a meaning that made him a much more well-rounded person. They gave him purpose outside of his artistic creativity. I'm just shaking, so nervous. <laughs> the last time John and I met was a couple of years ago when he and Kathy joined my wife Alice and I in Oaxaca for several days during our yearly February sabbatical there. We ate some great food, took in some sights, and John and I even crawled around on all fours in a cave inside some ruins. We took a couple walks together and talked about our lives, just like we would sometimes do around Lake of the Isles in Minneapolis. For those of you who have never been there, that's that lake they show at the beginning of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Anyway, I never thought that would be the last time I saw him. Uh, I was making plans to visit Cleveland after John's aneurysm when I received the news that he had passed. It's hard to believe I will never again hear his unique voice over the telephone. I'm going to miss hearing that distinctive giggle of his. But more than anything else, I'm going to miss my friends' love and support. In a world where true, hand, true friends are hard to find, it hurts to not have my life anymore. My life has been greatly enriched by knowing John. His legacy lives on in his art, the people he has touched. His loving soulmate, Kathy. His beautiful children, Ruby and Mimi. God bless and sail on, my brother. <laughs> um, up next, we're going to hear from Dan, who's going to um, perform a poem that my dad would quote a lot. Um, it was uh, Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Um, he, I presume that he may have memorized this for um, him and his siblings growing up had a poetry night where they had to memorize poems. So uh, we believe that's when he memorized it. Um, he would also quote the, um, is it the walrus and the carpenter? That's, um, the time has come, the walrus said, to speak of many things, of ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and of kings. I don't know if that's the right one, but that's what he said, so I've memorized it from hearing it so many times. So, and he would also say, beware the Java walker. So uh, we're gonna hear a performance from Dan here. Except for the wooden sword, which is my grandfather's, and I thought, I wonder what that was ever used for, and this is what it's for now. <laughs> and so when she said perform, this is going to be a loose rendition, because I memorized this in high school, and we had to do a poetry notebook when I was in ninth grade, and I thought, that's such a great poem. Um, and I don't know what it means, but I love my English teacher, and that inspired me to be an English major. Um, and so it was great when I found out it was John's favorite poem, too, and that he quoted it often, because I do too. Um, and I didn't get to know John as well as I would have liked or have as much time with him, but I'm sure everybody here feels that way. Um, and one of the nicest things I think he said was when he found out that I grew up on a farm, he said, the world needs more farm boys. So I was like, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to do this from memory, so we'll see how this goes. Twas brillig in the slidey toes, did gyre and gimbal in the wave, all mimsy were the boragoos and the mome rats outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the mangsum foe he sought, and rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tolji wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack, 
He left it dead, and with his head, he went galumphing back. <laughs> and hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Uh, oh, frap to stay, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the slidey toes, did gyre and gimbal in the wave. On them see where the bora grows, and the mole rats out green. All right, up next we're going to hear from Cousin Wendy. Yeah, that was really something. <laughs> I never heard John recite that poem. I wish I had. My name is Wendy Clavier Sohan. I'm John's cousin. Um, now that I know that other family who aren't here are listening, I just want to send my love out to all of you. Always, when I thought of John, I thought of those puzzles, you know, those picture puzzles. One of these things is not like the others. He was a red crayon in a box of blue crayons, maybe an orange crayon in a box of blue crayons. When I was a kid, sort of a 1960s teeny bopper, John was, in my eyes, a rock star. He was a very cool older cousin. I understood even then, though, that he was a red crayon, and I was probably just a common blue crayon. But he listened and responded to me as though I had important things to say, which I really didn't. <laughs> we had a connection which lasted throughout our lives, maybe in part because I too am a friend of Bill W. I think the only cousin who is, so maybe that's what distinguished me. John's thoughts and ideas and colorful stories mostly confounded me. Sometimes I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> Luckily, I could rarely get a word in edgewise, so there wasn't much pressure to conjure a response. <laughs> but if I came right out and told him I needed to say something, he stopped and he gave me his full attention and care. These were usually telephone conversations. I live in Florida. John understood the essential meaning and importance of family, and in this way, colorful as he was, unconventional as he was in many ways, he was very, very traditional when it came to his family. Not just Kathy and Ruby and Mimi, but his extended family. I mean, it mattered to him a lot to stay in touch. I'm just having this thought. I remember one time my older sister and I weren't getting along, and John actually called me to tell me, it really makes me sad when you and Kimmy aren't getting along. Sisters need to get along. He adored his mother and father and all of his siblings, he adored Ruby and Mimi. He told me one time, you guys, that the thing that you had that astonished him the most, being his daughters, was discernment. <laughs> <laughs> and he adored Kathy, who remained his true friend until the last day of his life, soulmate still. The thing about John that touched me the most deeply was that although he didn't aspire to be a blue crayon at all, he wanted to be in the box of blue crayons. Like all of us, he needed to belong. And I imagine that feeling of truly belonging wasn't always easy for John to locate or sustain. A quote from To Kill a Mockingbird, 
You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside his skin and walk around in it. I'm not sure any of us can truly know another, but we do want to be known. We want to be loved. It's harder for some of us than others to be seen and understood. Blue crayons <laughs> do have it easier. I imagine everyone here had their brains scrambled by John at one time or another, or laughed till you cried at his mastery of the absurd, or made him laugh, which was incredibly satisfying, or just marveled at how colorful he was in every way, or were touched by his warmth and unfailing kindness. John didn't have a mean bone in his body. Never was he ever mean. And he didn't like meanness in other people. And I think that's really rare. I have mean. I think everybody does a little bit, but John didn't. I experienced all of these things with John. And over my whole adult life, in maybe four conversations a year that lasted hours, three or four hours usually, I just always came to love him more. I will truly, truly miss him. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, to Kathy for letting me come up here. I really appreciate it, and Mike. Um, my name is Ed, uh, and I know John as a fellow member of AA. Um, years ago, uh, the Reader's Digest used to have a, um, a column or a section or a page dedicated, and it was called the most unforgettable person I ever met. And um, for me, this was John Thompson. Um, the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover, was never truer than John Thompson. I first met John in February, oh, about 10 years ago. It was snowing, there was snow on the ground, it was really cold. I was at a meeting, he came in late, <laughs> no hat, no gloves, shorts and tennis shoes, and he kind of looked scary to me, and um, all I could think of was, I hope he doesn't sit next to me. <laughs> Um, but it didn't take long before uh, I realized I had judged him wrong. He was a really nice guy, very colorful for sure. He had a colorful life. Nobody, um, I don't know if anyone has ever had the opportunity to hear his lead or part of it. It's, it's Hollywood fabulous, <laughs> totally, totally. It, it should be a, a, a movie in, it, in itself. But on a serious note, um, John was a good friend. He was kind and gentle, as other people have said that he never, I am not, okay, don't get me wrong, I am not a nice person, I am not kind, okay? Uh, but John was, to a fault, he was very, very kind. Um, he had a very strong spiritual side, believe it or not, and towards uh, the last few years, he really enjoyed meditation and a lot of, spiritual activities. He started several uh, reading groups that I was a part of and we read some very significant, um, some very lofty uh, literature together as a group. Um, as time went on, I think, I'm not sure, I think maybe five years ago, I don't know, maybe Mike would remember, but um, I had the honor of becoming his sponsor, okay? I got a lot of um, 
sympathy from a lot of people in the program. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering what I had, what, what had I just said yes to? Okay, uh, but we spent many Sunday afternoons at my dining room table, across from each other, reading parts of the big book and the 12 and 12. Uh, those of you that are in the program, John was stuck on step four, and we wrestled with that, and we, we will still be wrestling with it, okay? Uh, anyway, uh, after my dining room table, we switched to Tommy's on Coventry, okay? And there, uh, both of us, both John and I, have some common uh, physical traits. Anyway, uh, so we would go to Tommy's, and. John had had some health issues, and I have had some too, and we would say, we'll go to Tommy's and get a salad, and then we'll hit a meeting. I was like, I know, you're right, Mike. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, we can go to Tommy's, but all right, look at no French fries. No, no, no. Anyway, uh, we went to, we would go to Tommy's, and we would, I convinced him, and I did this, it sounds like something he would have done. I convinced him, well, you know, a BLT is kind of like a salad. <laughs> tomato, you know, and I convinced him that a BLT, and he said, well, yeah, for sure, and then let's say, hey, what the hell, one order of fries, we'll share it, okay? And then, um, since we were being good, both of us, then we added, oh, also, a chocolate milkshake. <laughs> okay, so, um, he was a man after my own, own heart in so, so many ways. But a very special moment, early in my association with him, um, I was asked to uh, lead at a meeting in, in uh, Cleveland Heights. Uh, it was, it's called Tuesday Fairmount. It's a big meeting in a, a big Episcopal church. And so, um, and I didn't know John very well at the time, but uh, I looked and I saw him come into the meeting with someone. And I thought, wow, I, you know, he made an effort to come hear my lead. And then afterwards, he introduced this person to me, and it was Kathy. And I, that still was a special moment to me. He said, I really wanted my wife to meet you. And uh, for me, that, that said it all. I was like, wow, because like I said earlier, I'm not a nice guy. <laughs> I don't know why anyone would want me to meet their, their spouse, but anyway, he did. He did. And, um, okay, let me just be brief, something John was never. Uh, <laughs> let me say that I'm very, very grateful that uh, I had his... I've had him in my life, okay? And that I have had the opportunity to have a John Thompson experience. I love you, John. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from my dad's brother, Michael. Two will try to keep it together, um, and I can't follow up with everybody else's kind of share. All I want to say is I love you, my brother. More than you know. And I'll leave it at that. I think everybody else has done a fine job of kind of expressing who he was. Anyway, I'm going to do the prayer for St. Francis, which again kind of surprised me when I come to find out that this is one of his favorite prayers. But anyway, here we go. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Excuse me. Where there is despair, hope. darkness light, where there is sadness joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to, 
to under yeah, to be understood is to understand, to be loved is to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I'm usually okay with speaking, uh, but for some reason I just For those of you that don't know me, I'm Kathy Thompson, and in John's words of late to the numerous doctors, therapists, and aides, his one and only wife, ex-wife and best friend. I didn't know Johnny Dromet, the way y'all did. I met John July 5th, 1985 in an aftercare group at the treatment center we both attended in Minneapolis. Oh, and I'm gonna say that a lot of stuff I mentioned in here has been in photographs behind me. It'd be kind of nice if they synced up, but I'm sure that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Jump in, sync it up. <laughs> um, I had just turned 22 and was newly sober he was cute, and he reminded me of the poster of David Cassidy I had on my wall as a kid. <laughs> I was new to the group, so in true John style, he wanted to make sure I felt welcomed and asked me to join the group for coffee after the meeting. The following day, he came to my parents' house. The day after that, he asked me to meet him at First Ave so he could introduce me to his friend Mark, my friend. Um, and then on Monday we had dinner, on Tuesday we went to a meeting together, and so on, and so on, and so on. He called me every day, and we saw each other every day for six weeks. There was no hanky-panky, you know, we were new to the program, so, you know. Um, this may sound a lot like my life, but it was John's life. Especially at the beginning, our lives were so intertwined, and for years he always spoke as we. John was a generous man, period. After those six weeks, he bought me a motorcycle <laughs> because I refused to ride on the back of his out to California, where he wanted to introduce me to his brother, Michael, and some friends who lived out west. I had the motorcycle for a week before he came to my senses, and we ended up driving his car. <laughs> he loved helping me out on the bike, I had never ridden anything, you know, bigger than a 250, and then teaching me stick, which I'm grateful for to this day. He wanted to share his knowledge and share his people. There were few breakups those first five years we dated, but he always came back. And in true John Thompson style, he asked me to marry him in the parking lot of Home Depot on the way home from our friend's funeral. <laughs> Said he wanted to spend the rest of his life with me. And we never really stopped spending our life together. Whew. Our life was one adventure after another. We bought an old school bus, which you have seen on the thing, to move our stuff out to LA, and it broke down before we got to South Dakota. <laughs> we lived in a loft downtown LA before it was cool to do so and became friends with the couple who lived in a camper on the street outside our unit. John would give Tito, you've seen a picture of him as well, money for his food stamps, and then we'd still go up and go pick out groceries for him. 
He would take Tito into Hollywood to go see a movie. He'd take Ruby with as well, just to go walk around. He always wanted to help people. He loved camping. He shined at cooking the one pot wonder meal. <laughs> Frying up spam and eggs, cleaning the pans with the whooshy, and making the coffee. He overthought the tent setup and the fire making, so those became my, you know, my chores. He loved returning to the Eastern Sierras, where he used to camp as a teenager. We'd go up with different friends from LA. We tent camped among the Sequoias with David and Lynn. Imagine that. And on one special trip, I got to observe the castration of the donkeys for three corner round. <laughs> there was always a surprise in store with John. In 1995, John suggested we go to this three day hippie festival in the desolate north, desert north of Reno, which culminates with the burning of a 40-foot wooden effigy. That was the year it rained at Burning Man, and we got to slosh around naked in a mud pool with our friends Tom and Annie. There was also a double rainbow and a dust storm, definitely worth the $35 ticket price. It was never boring with John. Recently, he traveled with Tom, same Tom, to Chernobyl. Why? <laughs> because they could. <laughs> if it was odd or taboo, John was all over it. His work ethic. He wasn't always timely, but he was dedicated and got the job done. The Northridge earthquake happened at 4.30 a.m. And at 7.30, among all the aftershocks, John's getting ready to go into the office. I told him the 10 freeway had collapsed and that he could not get there. No, 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 I'll just take Wilshire. <laughs> no, you should call first. Okay. Oh, I guess you're right. It looks like nothing's open today. <laughs> oh, John. His longest steady job has been working with David Thomas on all of his projects. He was the art guide for Ubu for 50 years. John loved the revival of Disasterdrome in London. In London. And again in UCLA. I remember how excited he was at the thought of organizing scraps, trash, and unwanted items in the lobby of the theaters. We call it disaster, so nothing can go wrong. That was John. Another quote of his was, rock and roll is all about moving big black boxes from one side of town to the other in the back of your car. <laughs> John's, uh, David, I have a couple things that David um, told me. Um, all conceptual flourishes aside, John was a down-to-earth guy, ready and willing to help. He was kind. When the brother of Jim Jones refused to retrieve his body or give him a burial, John stepped in. He had time for what needed to be done. He gave him his time. Through the ups and downs of our 50-year friendship, there was always loyalty and unconditional love. He was a Cleveland kind of guy. There will never be another. John feared, as many of us do, becoming obsolete and normal. In LA, Johnny was kind of starting to fade and he thought having kids was going to take that persona away forever. But lo and behold, he told me on many occasions that having the girls was the best thing that had ever happened, and he'd wished we'd had them sooner. Fatherhood brought him back to Ohio to be near family. So the last 25 years of his life, he was a man with a straight job and a family living in Shaker Heights, secretly dreaming of his daughters wearing laurel jumpers. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Our daughters, Ruby and Mimi, were everything to him. He told me repeatedly over the last six weeks that he had to get better to be there for the girls. He treasured every moment with them. The love he felt for his daughters was pure and simple, the only one of its kind in his life. From the moment each of them was born, his eyes wide, mouth agape in complete amazement. 
He ruled his world. He wanted to show them off and share all of his knowledge with them. We were a family and included our girls in just about everything we did. Travel, music, thrifting. Excuse me. like I'm on a train. Um, I think we taught him good. We started camping when Ruby was maybe nine months old. We continued camping trips for many years. The girl's favorite, I think, was when John would take us to Independence, where we'd go out to the desert to find those donkeys and feed them rolls of lifesavers. <laughs> and the girls would like to share a, you know, a special moment that they've had. Or, you know, a something. So. Well, I'll just say, yeah, I love those donkeys. That it really is one of my favorite memories of him. And we went, I don't remember when I was that young, uh, that trip that my mom's talking about feeding the donkeys, but um, I remember the stories about uh, them, and I always wanted to actually go and experience it as a more um, conscious person. So um, I, I do remember we... We did go back um, in maybe 2016. Uh, my dad and I uh, hiked up the Sierras and also went looking for the donkeys. And when we finally found them, uh, you know, my dad pulled the car over next to him and then he was like, all right, gentlemen, we're just gonna pull over here. And he kept calling them gentlemen. <laughs> and I thought that was very sweet and we fed them, we fed them lifesavers. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, those, those donkeys were waiting for those lifesavers for so long. <laughs> Finally, they got them again. Um, the story I was actually going to tell, and I thought that my mom was going to bring it up. I don't know if this is like, you know, the story about my dad. Obviously, it's like hard to choose anything, but my mom was saying how she wanted to kind of talk about some of the uh, ways he was involved in our lives growing up, in school projects and stuff. And um, there was some kind of science thing where um, I wanted to make a shoe phone uh, for school uh, and show that off. And uh, my dad immediately was on it and was like, I got this whole plan. And he was like, first we need to go to the thrift store. We need to go specifically to the Unique and Northfield because they always have chunky shoes there. And you know, it's just such a John Thompson story because you know, it's plans, only he would know where the chunkiest shoes are, you know what I mean? <laughs> so then we go, we get a big pair of platforms, and, you know, this was in the uh, late 2000s, so a lot of people were probably getting rid of their, like, late 90s platform boots, so there were tons of uh, chunky shoes there, and um, we cut the, we cut a hole in the sole, and he had this phone that was shaped like a cell phone, like a flip phone, but you still had to plug it into a phone jack. Um, and so he was like, you're just going to put the phone in here, and then, you know, when you need to make a call, then you still need to find a phone jack, take off your shoe, remove the sole, remove the phone, plug the phone in. <laughs> but all my classmates were very impressed, but that's another thing too, it's like, where do you even get a, a gadget like that? And that's the kind of thing that he collected um, with weird gadgets um, and chunky shoes. So it was, you know, exactly the kind of thing. And, you know, anytime I had any kind of creative project that I wanted to do, he was the first person I went to to say, you know, wh what kind of tool do I use for this? You know, I want to make a theremin, but I don't know, you know, uh, what resistor to use and all this stuff. So uh, he was he was always very... Um, involved in that sort of thing. So um, John also, um, he shared his love of travel with uh, the girls and uh, his love of France with them. Hello, uh, bear with me. I don't have like a script, so I'm just gonna, just gonna speak. Um, yeah, as my mom mentioned, my dad, I mean, as I'm sure many of you know, my dad loved France, huge Francophile, loved the French language, um, and when I switched to Laurel, I had the choice to make uh, about what language I would want to study, and uh, he actually said, don't take French yet, he said, take Latin, you need Latin as a base for everything. 
So I took Latin in middle school and then I added French in high school. And he was very, very excited about that and he loved to speak French with me. And uh, I continued to study French when I was in college. And um, I can't remember because I don't think it was my graduation, but it might have been, but he met my French professor, Monsieur. <laughs> As it's called. <laughs> and, <Nobody know> him. <laughs> yeah. and he was a chaotic man, um, chaotic professor, but nice guy. And he was so excited to meet my dad. And my dad was really, really excited to meet him. He sat in on the French class, which thinking back, I'm like, oh my god, how embarrassing. <laughs> When I was at my college reunion for my five year, Monsieur, uh, I saw him and he asked about my dad and remembered him. So like you all know, my dad's a memorable guy. And uh, just with his love of uh, French language in France, we traveled a lot and we traveled to France together. And um, my junior year, I studied abroad in London and at the end of that experience, and I had many college friends actually, when they were talking to me about my dad, when I shared this news with them about his passing, they were like, oh, I remember when you and your dad went on your road trip uh, after uh, London, and that was such a big adventure. And it meant a lot to me that my college friends remembered that about him. Um, but we rented a car, it was a stick shift, and he had taught me how to drive stick shift, but I was not gonna do that uh, <laughs> in Europe, so he could only drive it. And as Mimi mentioned on her radio show, my dad was kind of a chaotic driver uh, and like made some questionable choices on the road. Um, but he was speeding um, on our way to Biarritz and we were pulled over by the French police. And I was very, very nervous <laughs> about this interaction, especially because, you know, my dad was very confident in his French, but I, I think the French would think otherwise. <laughs> back to the police car, and, you know, so I'm really stressed. My dad, I don't know if he's stressed or not, but like, I'm just really anxious about it. And the officer comes back, he's like, Monsieur, Monsieur, you know, you, you'll be fine. We're not gonna do anything right now, but remember, tranquil, tranquil. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's something that I'll always remember, and it's something that he, my dad would often talk to me on the phone, where if there's something chaotic going on in his life, or if I was stressed out and telling him about something chaotic in my life, he would always say, remember, tranquil. <laughs> so that's something that I'll always hold dear. <laughs> so, um, going back to the kids, uh, he introduced them to public trans at a young age, and we took them to shows where they would end up asleep in a t-shirt box under the merch table or downstairs here in the dressing room, of course. A more recent fave family adventure was a trip to Las Vegas where we stayed overnight near Area 51 at the Little Ailey Inn, um, but did not encounter anything too bizarre. We did look. Um, we did find a picked clean cow skeleton. You, things you saw him holding the, the backbone um, on one of our walks into the desert and we did um, we stayed at the Venetian which was really fun <laughs> and visited Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum and attended punk rock bowling which was really good okay John was complicated his emotions were complicated John was different things to different people. He tried to be everything to everybody, no matter the cost. He would suffer himself in order not to hurt someone else's feelings. He thought lying to someone was better than telling them the hard truth. And these lies often snowballed hurting the people he cared about most. John would also try to be kind to the people that others found insufferable, even though they treat him like crap. Whenever he was confronted, he'd say, I'm a nice guy, I just make some poor decisions. John lived his life the way he wanted to live it. He was an addict. He didn't break free of his addictions by getting sober. 
His addictions were complicated. They kept him satisfied and happy for brief moments of time, but as many of us know, it's never enough. There was a certain emptiness to him, always searching for something. His creative mind kept him engaged and sometimes got the better of him. He was a grand storyteller and loved listening to others. The more bizarre and unbelievable, the better. He was so kind and giving that that opened the door to be taken advantage of by self-serving individuals. With all the contradictions, he had a beautiful life, a life he loved, a life he wanted to continue with the folks who had his best interests at heart. During his last six weeks, he had moments of clarity and common sense and a willingness to change and accept. I think we have all experienced the pleasure and pain of being in a relationship with John Thompson. Over the past 38 years of my life, my entire life, he never left my consciousness, married or unmarried. I am told that I too never left his. I cherish the honor and the burden of being John's one and only, his confidant and best friend. When I arrived at the hospital that first day, I saw him and instinctively knew what to do. He knew I was there to take care of him. As I got closer to the bed, he looked at me deep into my eyes, piercing the same way he did during our wedding vows. I'd be happy you're here, he said. I'm not going anywhere. Play the song. This was John's song to me on our wedding night. It describes it perfectly. 